Never. Never change this tournament. Never. You want to take out the auto bits. You want to take out the auto bits. You want more at large bits. No, we don't get that. Never. Never change this tournament. It is the best thing we have in sports. The very best thing we have in sports. Never change this tournament. Never change this tournament. That is, of course, the voice of yours truly. After Jack Golke, the pride of Pewaukee, took down the Kentucky Wildcats and John Calipari in the first round of the NCAA tournament, I tried. I did my very best. I begged. I pleaded. Do not change this tournament. But NCAA tournament expansion is on the horizon in Division I basketball. Yes, basketball, not men's basketball. But basketball writ large, men's and women's. What it means for Wisconsin, what it means for the tournament writ large, and how we got here. On today's episode of the Scotty Six Pack Podcast, good morning, and thank you for enjoying it with the Six Pack. The Scotty Six Pack, the only podcast talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. I'm your host, Kedrick Stumbrus. You can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbrus, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack. For the latest updates in Wisconsin sports, you can watch us on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Scotty Six Pack, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. March Madness expansion. It's coming. It is coming. Whether you like it or not, I am the or not. <laughs> As you may have noticed from the kicker at the top of the show, of course, this has been rumbling in the background for some time. When the college football playoff went to 12 teams, those rumblings became a bit louder. But really, this has been rumbling in the background for almost eh, for two years at this point. It's been bubbling. And now it, it appears the momentum has built to the point of inevitability. Um, and look, the, the audience of this show, of course, is Wisconsin sports fans by and large. But I know there are many, many, many of you who are also college basketball fans. Um, I remember listening back to the, the preview of, of Wisconsin, not listening back, when I recorded the preview of Wisconsin playing Purdue the first time in the regular season this past year, we, we had a commenter, uh, a, a Purdue fan, and said, I don't know a Wisconsin sports fan, but we just love listening to college basketball content, and this, this is high-quality content. So I felt this was important to cover on this show, not just because it affects the Wisconsin Badgers or the Marquette Golden Eagles or UW-Milwaukee, Green Bay, in some tangential way, but because it, it continues to tell the story of the ongoing changes in college athletics that are affecting us as sports fans as college basketball fans for the people who are here and the way the NCAA tournament is going to end up changing kind of and the why of it in particular goes a little bit against the grain for the reasons we have seen such rapid postseason expansion in other realms. Something, cards on the table, I have generally been against in every instance. I do not love the expanded college football playoff. I understand it. I don't love it. Uh, I think four was a uniquely bad number. I don't like 12 either. Um, it's probably better than four. The expanded baseball playoff seems silly to me. The expanded NFL playoff seems silly to me, even if the Green Bay Packers got in at because of that third wild card but the expansion of the NCAA tournament is kind of something else entirely because it does exist in almost this third realm of sports where you you have people who follow a, a regular season 
for every sport or, or for each any one sport. They follow the regular season. They follow that sport year round. Okay. You also get casual watchers of the NFL playoffs of the Super Bowl. But the NCAA tournament, particularly, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the first weekend of March Madness exists in this third space that I think, and I, I would love to hear anybody else in the comments sound off if, if you disagree with me, if I am too insulated to college basketball and I, I am propping this tournament up larger than what it actually is. I understand, you know, what I'm about to say is a little inflammatory. The TV numbers don't exactly match up. Or maybe I'm forgetting something else that reaches this, this same kind of uh, mountaintop. But to me, the NCAA tournament exists in this other third space where it becomes part of the mainstream American consciousness where sporting and non-sporting fans alike tune in akin to the Super Bowl, where everybody has what they do on Super Bowl Sunday. Doesn't matter if you're a football fan. That was even more true with the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl this year and watching Travis Kelsey and, and uh, T Taylor Swift do their <laughs> a very public dating journey um, this past year. I think is a really good example of of that, and you know it's not the best example because there's also this third third factor of uh, perhaps the most famous woman in the in the world right now. But the way the NCAA tournament captures the imagination of so many of how Jack Golke can capture the nation's attention, someone who is probably taking a job down the street from my apartment at Northwestern Mutual. Going pro in, like I said, in that day one recap episode of the NCAA tournament, going pro in anything other than sports. Can capture the imagination of an entire country for two hours on a Thursday evening in March. That's something we don't get from basically anything else in sports. So at a time where the landscape of college athletics is so in flux, is so uncertain. Why? Why would the NCAA and its member schools, which is actually the important part here, its member schools, not kill the golden goose, but try to shove some more feathers into its coat. Why? Why? I know you're all screaming the answer is money. More games, more teams, more money. But it's actually not that simple. It really isn't. And it's why I wanted to record this episode. So th this tournament expansion conversation is stemming from the Wednesday presentation given at the annual conference commissioner's summer meeting. And I'm, I'm going to cite a lot of reporting here, a, a, a kind of a, a conglomeration of reporting from Ross Dellinger, uh, Yahoo Sports senior college football reporter who has been really at the forefront of reporting you know, all, all of these changes to NCAA governance structures, the, its transformation committee, um, a lot of the college football playoff changes. And then also reporting from CBS Sports uh, college basketball reporter Matt Norlander, who was at the cutting edge of reporting all of the buzz around NCAA tournament expansion over the last two years in particular. Norlander has been really ahead of the curve on uncovering this uh, in these conversations better than anybody. So a lot of their reporting got out uh, yesterday on Thursday, June 20th. So at the conference commissioner's annual summer meeting, Dan Gavitt, the NCAA vice president for the men's basketball championship, presented a couple of models for expansion of the NCAA tournament. And those models included options to expand to 72 or 76 teams, adding four or eight additional teams, adding four or eight additional games. And 
of course, that takes the slightly imperfect bracket that we have now at 68 teams and makes it even, I guess, more slightly imperfect, less perfect. Uh, and you either have to add one additional site that looks like the first four site that we have in Dayton now, or two additional first four sites if you go up up to 76 teams at eight teams at eight games. The, the idea is that you have this spot in Dayton and then one, you know, further out West to accommodate teams that then would be placed into sub regionals more in the Western part of the country. It's uncertain, you know, where those teams would be playing exactly if it would be, a rotating location or if it would be a semi-permanent location like Dayton has become for the first four. And it seems that this is an inevitability at this point. We, we have reached the point where it is being, you know, talked about, socialized, considered out in the open, not just for conference commissioners, but obviously now through reporting, gauging, public interest which frankly i don't think they're gonna give much of a darn about but this will have to go in front of the ncaa the the, the committee that selects the field for the tournament will also will end up voting on an actual proposal pass it that will go up to like the men's basketball competition committee before ultimately going up to the uh, board of directors of the NCAA for division one. The other thing that comes along with this is that any expansion, any modification to the men's tournament is expected to coincide with expansion to the women's tournament. Part of this is because the NCAA cannot afford another public relations spectacle that they got themselves into when they had a terribly funded, terribly put together women's division one national championship in 2021. And we saw significant backlash over how the NCAA was supporting women's division one athletes in comparison to how it was supporting men's division one athletes. Just from not even from a, you know, monetary perspective, you, you can say what you want to say about the women's tournament and it not being profitable because that does come up in this conversation, but there is a general level of you need to actually treat these athletes. Well, that was not necessarily happening in the locations for the women's tournament in 2021. But given that the NCAA tournament's expansion would be a money loser, the why for this feels strange. And it being a money loser on its face doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? Well, why would it be a money loser? You're giving these huge television companies where you have huge television contracts more games, more inventory. But those contracts are signed. Those contracts were very recently signed. The contract for the men's tournament was just re-upped with Turner and CBS, and that goes through 2032. Same thing for the women's tournament, and that contract was just signed and extended on the deal with ESPN that also runs through 2032. And there is not language in those contracts that requires CBS, Turner, ESPN to pay any more money to the NCAA if there are more games. Beyond the fact of that, the games themselves existing on the very fringes, you know, you're, you're letting in a, a 69th through 76th team. These aren't particularly valuable games for inventory. And, and keeping in mind that I know Matt Norlander shared this of CBS Sports. The NCAA does not want to shift the calendar, the competition calendar for 
the men's basketball championship or for the women's basketball championship. They don't want to add another week on to the season. So conference tournaments are going to stay where they are now. You know, the first four, first eight, first 12, whatever they are going to call it, is going to exist in that same kind of window with games on Tuesday and Wednesday after Selection Sunday. I get together on that Wednesday night with my younger brother and watch those first four games every year. But those aren't really the money makers. Those are not the games where everyone is getting together and sitting around and watching basketball all day, unless you are generally a psycho. I think we, as the larger college basketball commentary at larger college basketball fans loved getting together and watch Virginia fail to score a single point in an hour of real time during the first four, keeping in mind that more teams like Virginia will be the ones getting into this expanded NCAA tournament, and that seems bonkers. But even if there was a kicker in there to, to renegotiate a, a dollar price for these games, these games clearly aren't that valuable. I, I think it's pretty easy to say without being a major television executive. I think it's pretty easy to intuit that. And on top of the fact that the women's tournament Although it just had its largest year by, by revenue, by television ratings, is at this time not profitable. And on top of that, you know, it's not just that they have to throw it up on TV, right? So it's not like ESPN is just eating the cost of additional games being aired for the women's tournament. It's the NCAA having to secure those sites, get those sites reserved for the tournament actually secure those sites with like on-site security staffing the arenas uh and then you end up making that money back through ticket sales what have you but you need to go through the process of having those places available your venues available these games i think are pretty clearly gonna lose money in in some way on their face so why does it make sense to have them? why if the pot of money itself is not going to change at least not for eight years because there is a longer term play here where eventually this deal does make you more money when the new deals come up when the tournament has expanded to 72 or 76 teams and then in 2032 when your new television contract kicks in or after 2032 rather you have a more valuable more lucrative contract because you've let in uh more Virginias into the NCAA tournament. Ultimately, this comes from power conference greed. And division one must certainly genuinely fear a breakaway from the power conferences, from the autonomous conferences, from the big time, big 12, ACC. SEC, because it's not like these committees that would have to vote on and eventually approve tournament expansion are only made up of representatives from power conference committees. They, they are made up from representatives of schools of all shapes and sizes from all conferences. So why? Why would they sign up on for this? Because... It's not like the the teams that are going to benefit the most from this are teams in the Western Athletic Conference in the WAC. Not like the teams that are going to benefit the most from this are teams in the NEC. Nope. It's going to benefit by adding, you know, six more, four more, eight more at-large teams that are mostly going to come from these power conferences. Because it's not like you are creating a new conference out of thin air and you need to have these additional spots in the NCAA tournament to account for them. In fact, we're losing a conference in the PAC 12 and I'll, and I'll circle back around to that for the end of this. But one of the points that you see in advocates for tournament expansion is that 
as Division One has expanded from 200 some teams to now whatever it's going to be this year, 360 some odd teams, because it's always fluctuates somewhere in that 360 to 365 range lately. When Division One has expanded, as the size of the tournament has stayed stagnant, you have fewer a smaller proportion of teams represented in the NCAA tournament as a whole of the teams from Division One, And at a certain point, this makes sense, right? The NCAA transformation committee that existed for a handful of years to decide, you know, how we, we were going to transform the rules of compensation and whatnot in the NCAA that ultimately just had its hands forced by the courts anyway, but there were parts of that that said, hey, we need to make a baseline level for, you know, 25% of programs that compete in a sport, at least at Division One, need to be represented in the national championship competitions. That's why we got expansion in Division One ice hockey, for example, for the women's tournament. That tournament expanded from uh, 8 to 12 teams. Part of that was because it was to make room for a new conference with a new auto bid in Division One, where if you win your conference, win your conference tournament, you get an automatic qualification to the national championship tournament held by the NCAA. It's not like that's happening in Division One men's basketball or Division One women's basketball. All we are getting when we expand out Division I basketball is you're adding more teams that look like... <laughs> I feel bad because I'm sitting down here in Edinburgh five minutes away from UTRGV right now, but look like UTRGV from the WAC, which... Or look like... Uh, I guess Merrimack's a bad example because they've been running through the NEC, but um, that look like a St. Francis, right? The, these teams that are getting added into Division One aren't the ones that are actually competing for these tournament spots. So expansion based on the fact that you have a greater proportion of teams that need to be competing for entrance into March Madness simply does not make sense on its face. Because in some of these other sports, you have had teams that would enter Division One or enter Division Two, what have you, that would in a world where you expanded the proportion of teams, expanded the number of teams to get into those national championship tournaments. Those new entrants to Division One are actually competing for those spots. But because we have a sport in college basketball where 360 plus teams are technically all competing for the same national championship, which is bonkers. Doesn't make sense. Those teams that are entering Division One are not actually competing at the fringes for these final spots that we are advocating to now exist in the men's basketball tournament. So this proportionality argument does not make sense once you go beyond the numbers and recognize the reality of what those teams being added to Division One are. There's no reason that adding these teams to the WAC, to the NEC, and I feel bad because I'm like kind of pounding on the whack in the NEC in this conversation. Um, the Big West. We'll go to the Big West. <laughs> There's no reason that more teams in those conferences should give greater access to the NCAA tournament for a 500 record of a team from the Big Ten. Why does that make sense? That team in the Big Ten is still going to have that 500 record regardless of whether or not the Big West has 6, 7, 8, 12 teams. It doesn't make sense. But there is a fear that if, if these power conferences do not get their way, because again, these power conferences aren't going to be the one who ultimately aren't going to be the ones who ultimately on their own decide what happens with conference tournament or sorry, NCAA tournament expansion altogether. It is these three committees that have representatives from across the spectrum of Division One. But those smaller schools that are represented on those committees 
fear a real breakaway from power conferences. And I'm not reporting, I'm not reporting this. I'm not like, I'm, I'm not citing anybody's reporting, but there has been plenty of talk about these power conferences and what, what, what would they do? Would they go and create their own thing? Would there just be an sec big 10 tournament and they would declare itself the national championship. It seems clear that these smaller schools actually fear that happening because why else would they do this? Why else when the pot of money is staying the same and you would then expand the tournament out and have to create more NCAA tournament shares of revenue because for every game, you as a team win in the NCAA tournament, whether that's in the first four, whether that's in the final four, for every game that you win, you bring money to your conference. You win effectively prize money for your conference. For every team, your game, for every game, your team wins in the NCAA tournament. But if that pot of money is not actually increasing, why? Why would the smaller conferences allow more of these at-large teams in? Because these at-large teams, more of these at-large teams that are then going to go into a, a play-in round, essentially. Those play-in round games still get those NCAA tournament shares. So these smaller schools are just giving up more money as part of these shares. So the idea as a whole is a money loser for the tournament. The idea as a whole is a money loser for these smaller teams. The only reason it makes sense to do this is because these smaller teams are terrified of the big schools, of the power four schools, breaking away and making their own national championship. Because I don't think the NCAA wants to do this, not in the midst of this very tenuous college athletics model right now. And given that tenuous model, are we going to see some of these smaller conferences fold that can't compete really in Division One with the fact that you you have to be able to pay players to compete at a certain level and you just eventually you're going to fall behind somewhere? Clearly, these smaller schools are terrified because, yeah, they are being subsidized. The auto-bid teams from the Big West, from the Mountain West, I, Mountain West is a bad example, um, from the... from the Missouri Valley are being subsidized by these big schools who are really drawing in the most money to this tournament. And if you don't appease those schools, they might go do their own thing and then you are left with nothing. So even if these big schools aren't going to get more money immediately, they're setting themselves up to do it but they might actually be getting more money immediately just because of the fact that you are expanding out the auto bids. And I am torn because you could say, all right, small schools, yes, we will sign on to this, but we want to be the ones represented in more of these play-in games so that we have a chance to get more of these early first four or whatever you're going to call it now NCAA tournament shares and make more money early on in the tournament. But if we get that, then we are pushing more of these terrible power conference teams that are going to get in the back end of the tournament that are going to get a, get in as teams 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, so many more teams. Those teams being in the main 64 team bracket right away, more of them, eight more of them. Maybe that's better for the smaller schools on their face because they might get more money in NCAA tournament shares by winning those first four games. But then we don't get Oakland and Kentucky. We don't get Norfolk State and Missouri. Had to let the uh, Kansas Jayhawk in me out of there. We don't get that. So there is a real push pull there that that is going to be hard to reconcile and given that the big schools want or big conferences big schools want more of this money 
you, you have already done this to yourself. You are already giving it to yourself because you already killed off the Pac-12. This is the point I said I was going to circle back around to earlier. Pac-12 on average, uh, according to Matt Norlander, has gotten a little over an average of four bids per year over the last 10 tournaments. Over the last 10 years, when, that includes 2020 when Pac-12 was, was projected to get four teams in. So those extra four bids, where are they going to? Well, they're probably going to be split you know, somewhat evenly because that's one auto bid and an average of about three at-large at bids. Spread those up. I think basically one of those is going to go to the Big 12 every every year. I think one of those is going to go to the Big 10 every year. One of those is going to go to the SEC every year. And then that fourth one will go somewhere between those three conferences or the ACC. Just the way it is. Because, yeah, Indiana State had a real shot at making the tournament last year, and maybe it was snubbed, but. Push comes to shove. The money, the brands in college athletics always seem to win out. So you are, as conferences, you're kind of already getting this expansion. You know, you, you as a conference entity, and I understand the, the NCAA is made up of its member schools. The conferences are made up of its member schools. But U.S. conference are going to get more teams in, at least one more team in, basically every year, because you have picked these teams off from somewhere else. But are you, the Big Ten, are you pleased enough? Are you appeased enough by getting in one more of the four Washington, Oregon, USC, UCLA every year? Or do you need to go get more? It seems that it is that you have to go get more. And it's annoying. And I I don't know what I would prefer to see if I'd prefer to see, you know, some of these, you know, first eight, first 12 games just become a big mid-major showcase on Tuesday and Wednesday. I don't know. Maybe that's fun. Maybe that's cool. And you get a chance for these mid-major conferences to win NCAA tournament shares early, and that's neat. But then you take out more of these opportunities for teams to get placed directly into the bracket and actually get to play with some rest and play to knock out a, a Kentucky. We do see the thing every single year, I think except for one since the first four has existed, we get at least one of those teams that make it to the second round. Is that as a proportion going to increase if we have more power conference teams in those first games? Is that going to decrease if we have more mid-major conference teams in those first four games, more low-major teams in those first four games? I don't know. Uh, but all I know is that th there is clearly fear from the NCAA, which makes its money. And, and I don't mean the NCAA and its member schools. I mean like the institution of the NCAA staffed by people, right? Fear that it's big money making operation, which is the NCAA men's basketball tournament, Division One men's basketball tournament. There, there is clearly fear there that the power conferences will break away and make their own tournament if they are not appeased by the NCAA and its smaller schools. Because I don't think with the state of college athletics in flux as it is right now, that the NCAA would want to do this, that these smaller schools would want to do this. They're doing this out of one thing and one thing only, and it is fear that they will be left behind. So let that sink, sink in. We're going to get it. Tournament expansion is coming as early as 2025. That's not this upcoming season, but next college basketball season. Here it comes. We're going to get NCAA tournament expansion, perhaps a full two years earlier than uh, Wisconsin football going to go play Pitt in Ireland. <laughs> uh, so I, I hope you enjoyed my my tirade, my screed against NCAA tournament expansion today. Uh, we might have an episode drop over the weekend, but we will probably be back with you in your ear holes on Monday, uh, talking through some big events on the weekend. Looking forward to Wisconsin basketball holding its advanced camp next week and handing out some new scholarship 
offers. Uh, we're also getting dangerously close to NFL training camp uh, as that comes up. And the all-star break for the Milwaukee Brewers is right around the corner. So stay tuned. The Milwaukee Bucks offseason is going to get rocking and rolling soon. Here we go. It, it's it's still a busy time of year. Always, always, always is here on the Scotty Six Pack. Talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. I've been your host, Kedrick Stumbrus. You can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbrus, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. While you are here listening on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave a nice comment. Tell me what you think about NCAA tournament expansion. Should the tournament expand? Are you happy about it? Are you mad about it for the Wisconsin Badgers? Maybe that's a good thing because frankly, there's going to be, I mean, it's going to be hard to find a year where the Badgers do not make the tournament in a 76 team field. And if they do, if they do miss, then yeah, it's probably time to fire a kick guard. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. That's enough on Wisconsin. <laughs>